Thanks, thanks, Suchita. And hello and welcome again, everyone. So EdTech Research Group at the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education um, is really a community of uh, faculty, researchers, practitioners, and students who are engaged uh, in researching educational technology in and its various facets. The group uh, anchors uh, various action research uh, uh, projects and uh, ed tech research, uh, which is non-action also. Uh, but importantly, the group also anchors the uh, MA in Education and Technology, which is a unique uh, master's program, which has been started from this current academic year. Um, so uh, this ed tech talk series is also an important part of the program as well as the community. So this is, we are very pleased that we have, uh, uh, we had a lineup of uh, wonderful uh, speakers from industry, from policy uh, practice side, as well as from the academia. So welcome everyone. Towards the end of the uh, talk, we will also uh, keep session open to uh, have, uh, if there are any queries regarding the MA program or the group. So thank you for joining. Anil, if you could take a lead and introduce our speaker for today. Sure, yeah. yeah. Good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Talk 5. So um, Geeta Krishnan has more than uh, 30 years of experience across diverse sectors, advertising, online learning, entrepreneurship development, management education, and professional development uh, in various leadership and consulting capacities. Geeta has an MBA from IIM Bangalore and uh, has recently defended his doctoral thesis at I am Indo. As the head of the Digital Blended Learning Program at the Indian Institute for Human Settlement, Gita has launched multiple online learning courses across the world's leading, leading platforms like Coursera and edX, and also on IIH's own platform, covering more than 50,000 learners. Earlier, as Director, Center of uh, Executive Education of the Indian School of Business, he managed the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Entrepreneurship Development Program for seven years providing business education to almost 1,500 women. He has also worked with Babson College and Leeds University in designing similar programs. Geeta has consulted with uh, multiple other national and international institutes, including the National Stock Exchange, the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Street City, and the United Nations Environment Program. He's also an advisory board member of NUSOCIA, a social venture. Geeta's research and uh, Teaching interests are in the areas of entrepreneurial mindset and growth, strategy, leadership, and change management, and institutional learning and continuous learning. And uh, full disclosure, Geeta was also my boss at Data Interactive Systems in the early 2000s. Over to you, Geeta. Thank you, uh, Manan, and uh, thank you, Chita and uh, Sadakat. Uh, it's great to be here to have a conversation with, with folks in an intersection between two areas that have been of particular interest for me over, over a very, very long time. As, as Anil mentioned, he and I worked together in Data Interactive way back in the, we started, I think, around 2000, so that makes it about 20, 23 years. Uh, so that's that's been something that I've been involved in for this long in terms of online learning technology in the learning process, et cetera. And over the last seven years, and actually about 10 years, my focus on entrepreneurship has also been equally intense, thanks to, as Anil mentioned, 10,000 Women program, but also the, the PhD program that I recently defended my thesis on was also focused on entrepreneurship, specifically on women entrepreneurship. So that really was the genesis of, of the conversation that Anil and I had a few, I believe it's been a few months already, but a few months ago. And one of the things that kind of uh, I've been working on and looking at very closely is not the larger frame of entrepreneurship alone, but specifically on the mindset of the individual entrepreneur. How does an entrepreneur think? What are the characteristics that define an entrepreneur? And then when I started thinking about it, it kind of uh, extended and we keep talking about developing that entrepreneurial mindset, even if you're not an entrepreneur, right? I mean, we keep saying that there is no such thing as a creative discipline. It's the way you express your creativity respect of your discipline. And in some sense, the word the world of entrepreneurship kind of extends itself in the same format. So you can be entrepreneurial even if you're not an entrepreneur. It doesn't just mean that you need to run a business, you need to start something, et cetera. But in, in a lot of 
work that we do in a lot of professions that we practice, entrepreneurship is very intrinsic. It's very fundamental to, to the way we kind of develop. So, so that's really the germ of it. And, you know, while you may kind of rightfully accuse me of saying this because I have a hammer called entrepreneurship, I shouldn't think that every, every nail there is meant to be hammered with this. Uh, but, but there's certainly a relevance to looking at the entrepreneurial mindset in different contexts. So when I speak to students, irrespective of discipline, you talk to, you know, early stage engineering students, you say when you go and work in a professional workplace, that's not like your laboratory, right? So it's not governed by precisions, it's not governed only by rules, it's not that you'll get instructions that you just follow, but you need to express yourself, you need to go beyond what is conventionally defined as, as a role. So that's, that's entrepreneurship in, in a sense as well. And when you extend that to any profession, you'll see that elements of entrepreneurship become very fundamental to the way we work, to the way we succeed, to the way we express ourselves, to the way we, if I may put it extremely, to find satisfaction in, in the way we do what we do. So given that, uh, I, I thought that we'll kind of delve on that from the perspective of an educator. So and I use the word educator in a very broad context. You can be a teacher in a school, you can be a professor in an academic institution, you can be a trainer in the corporate environment, or you can just be teaching your child at home, right? So all of us are educators in the larger sense of the term. And how can we as educators benefit from an entrepreneurial mindset? And, and that's really what I will kind of focus on over the next few minutes. And if you can give me a second to share my screen, I will get going. Is that uh, visible? Yes. All right, great. Okay. All right. So, so I kind of, the, the essence of simplicity, I said, how can you think like an entrepreneur, right? So as, as an academic, as an educator, and particularly in the context of using technology. And the reason I kind of focus that is partly because Mom and I were talking about this and said that we are looking at education from the lens of technology and technology from the lens of education. But even there, I mean, the reason I think it's even more relevant in the context of academics is that when we look at our teaching, when we look at our, the content that we use, the pedagogies that we use in our classrooms, being innovative, being different, being modern, if you will, uh, comes a little more naturally to, to us, right? So because you keep teaching all the time, you can sense that there is something missing there. You can sense that there is something more that I can do. And therefore, you tend to adapt and adopt better as you go along. But when it comes to technology, sometimes we kind of see it as a barrier and we keep saying that there is the unstated me versus them mindset with respect to technology. Will it replace me? Will it make me less effective? Will my students overtake me in terms of knowledge of technology, et cetera? So in that sense, I think it's even more relevant to tie it closely to, to technology in terms of entrepreneurial thinking. Having said that, a lot of my examples and uh, inspirations as we go along will go beyond technology, will go into how we teach, how we approach our teaching itself. So I think that that's fair game in a, in a context like this. So let me spend a few minutes on the concept of entrepreneurship and the concept of an entrepreneur, right? So when we keep talking of entrepreneurship, and it's a word that has become particularly common in the last 20 years or so. Back in the 90s, when many of us did our master's program, and I went to a B-school myself, uh, the word entrepreneur was barely uttered in the two years that I was on campus. It wasn't a particularly glorious target in terms of career choices way back in the 90s, right? An entrepreneur was classically and derogatorily re referred to as a shopkeeper, right? So when Napoleon apart shopkeepers haven't particularly had a, a great name. So um, in that sense, so what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? And in today's context, for a lot of us, we keep getting exposed to a lot of entrepreneurs, be it at our workplace, be it in our families, be it in our social circuits. And a few terms kind of jump up very automatically when we say entrepreneur, right? So one of the things we keep discussing about entrepreneurs is that they are risk takers. Entrepreneurs have the propensity for risk that is higher than someone who is not an entrepreneur, right? So that's, that's something that we keep hearing about them all the time. Innovation is a huge word when it comes to entrepreneurs. They are there to innovate. As Shampatov famously said, when he began, they, they do disruption. So innovative disruption is something that defined an entrepreneur when it was first kind of formally coined, if you will, in, in the 1930s. Uh, we keep saying visionary, they see something that others do not see, right? So they go beyond the obvious, they go beyond what's possible today and create a future that others are not able to even visualize or envisage today. 
Uh, the word startup is something we use very common. That's the physical manifestation of entrepreneurship. It's a company that I start. It's a process through which I kind of bootstrap, build my business, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another word that comes up. And the other word that kind of comes up, and this came up for me particularly when I was researching women entrepreneurship, independence was a very, very big characteristic of going entrepreneurial, especially in a context like India. Women use the word more commonly when we ask questions about what triggered the entrepreneurial instinct in you, the, the need to be independent. Now, given that I worked for so many years, now I think that it's time for me to flower. It's for time for me to do something by myself. So it's not so much risk. It's not so much innovation or visionary. It's more saying, I want to be my own boss. I want to do things that I think are right. So right. So these are some terms and there are many more that you can pull up. And, and if any of you go to chat GPT and say, give me 10 words that characterize an entrepreneur, I can absolutely assure you that six, these six words will absolutely figure in those 10 words, right? But given all this, and if you go through the literature of entrepreneurship, there has actually been a lot of disagreement on, lot of, on many of these aspects. Are entrepreneurs really, really high on risk appetite? Are they really visionary? Do they really innovate as much as we talk about? There's a huge argument about innovators discover a product, but businessmen then make it successful. So who is the entrepreneur here? Is the one who invented the product or is the one who made the product commercially successful? And, you know, examples of virtually every product you use today, your smartphone, your computers, your photocopiers, they're all been invented by someone, but they are associated more strongly with others as having founded that space or established that space. So there has been a lot of controversy or a lot of uh, disagreement, if you will, in the research community on what an entrepreneur is and are they X and are they not X. And both sides of the arguments have been proven with reasonable success and therefore the coins tantalizingly poised in the air all the time. But there's one area which has drawn a lot of uh, agreement among research communities, and as much as research communities can agree on anything, is the fact that the act of entrepreneurship is fundamentally a pursuit of opportunity. Now, this is something that comes from all of these elements. So I chase an opportunity which can disrupt. I chase an opportunity which is innovative. I chase an opportunity that makes me visionary or makes me bring things out that have never been come out that have never come out. So the pursuit of opportunity, and therefore the key word there is really pursuit, is how does an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur think, how does he or she pursue an opportunity? Is the distinction between someone who thinks entrepreneurially and someone who does not think entrepreneurially. I want to use the contra word for this, which is used in the research literature. But so that's really the crux of, of entrepreneurship in a sense, right? So do I pursue opportunity? Now, when it comes to the pursuit of opportunity, one may argue that any organization that's focused on growth will pursue new opportunities. Can I expand my product portfolio? Can I increase the quality of my product? Can I enhance my price? Can I go to a new market? All of these are opportunities in a sense. And therefore, how does an entrepreneur pursue opportunity? And how does that differ from some of us who may not pursue it in the same zeal with the same method? So when you look at the pursuit of opportunity, it's, it's fairly straightforward to say that there are two ways in which you can define the search for opportunity, the identification of opportunity. One is what you call passive search, meaning you continue to do business as it were, you continue to do your regular same old things, and suddenly either a market shock or a piece of serendipity leads you to some new opportunity. Right? So this is passive search and you would agree that passive search is not a conscious strategy because you're not explicitly doing anything. It just happens and then you kind of uh, formalize it, if you will, and, and kind of pursue it after it's been identified. And the fact remains that if, if it can reach you by accident, it can perhaps reach your competitor or anybody else by accident. So passive search is, is a given. It's not a conscious strategy, if you will. And therefore, the second way of search is what you would call active search which in typical communicate in business parlance would mean you go to a market or you go to a set of customers, you talk to them, find out what they're doing today, how, what is their level of satisfaction with what they're doing today, and what is it that they're not happy with. The term pain point is something that you hear a lot in the world of business, right? Including in the world of entrepreneurship. So you identify customer pain points or customer pleasure points as it were, and then go after it and see, can I invent something? Can I discover something? Can I create something that can address that pain or pleasure as well? So that's, that's the active search process. 
However, even here, you will notice that this is something that most organizations, most businesses tend to do all the time. It's, it's part of their growth strategy to understand the market, understand the ecosystem, to kind of explore more opportunities. Now, the interesting part is neither of these two are really the routes that entrepreneurs seem to take. Because what they seem to take is a third route, which is what one may call opportunity as creation. Yes, they look at the market. Yes, they look at customers. Yes, they listen to the ecosystem. But what's happening in their head is they're coming at it from saying, what can I do? What can I create? And that is a very subtle but significant distinction from what does the market need? Because you might say that the moment I know what the market wants, I go back to my R&D setup as it were and start creating what it's required. But in an entrepreneur's case, it's, it, there's a half listening that happens to the marketplace. And the other half and more than the other half is spent on imagining what is it that I can produce. Many of the products we use today were imagined independent of, let's say, market research as it were. And that's really the essence of opportunity as creation. And that, that forms the focus of an entrepreneurial mindset. How do they do that? Again, it sounds like the activity of an idiosyncratic individual who kind of sits under a tree and imagines things and then brings them to reality. But there seems to be a method there. And again, this is based on research from across the world. And the first way the entrepreneurs look at the world is the classical two by two frame where you look at the world and say, how much of the world can you predict, right? Because by definition, whatever you're creating is for the future, is for usually an indeterminate future. But how much of that future do we know? How much can I predict about the future? And the second side they think about is how much can I control how the future is going to turn out, right? Typically, you would look at the lowest quadrant and say, yes, if I can't even predict and if I can't even control, I just operate from the seat of my pants as it were. So which means I am very adaptive in nature. I look at what the market talks about. I look at what's unfolding in this world. And then I try to adapt myself to, to the world. And as you can see, that that's not quite how you would imagine an entrepreneur. That's not how you would imagine someone who's going about trying to create something absolutely new and innovative. On the other side of that is what you typically associate the entrepreneur with, which is how visionary am I? Which means I can see the future. I can imagine a future tomorrow where people will live in Mars or people will live in outer space. And I think that I can create products now or I can imagine solutions now that can enable to capitulate on that market, on that population. So I think I have control, not just over ideas, but over resources, over ways of thinking, over operationalizing things, et cetera. And therefore, you call me a visionary. Now, this has been a classical definition of entrepreneurs because it's been assumed that entrepreneurs can see the future and shape the future, right? Now, the other side of the quadrant is when you look at where I can predict the world, but I know that my resources are limited, my ability to control my resources and my market are limited. And this is where typically you expect people to use causal logic. This is classical corporate thinking. I will figure out what's going to happen in the future. I will systematically work towards acquiring the resources, the know-how, and everything else that needs me to be successful. In other words, I will create the cost system for me because that's what I do not have because I know what the outcome is or I know what the world is going to be. Uh, these are three visions of the world, as it were. The adaptive is something that's low end, which is just you continue to exist and hope that as things happen, you will res respond to what's happening in the world. The visionary shapes the world because he or she controls a large part of how the world is going to emerge. And the person who involves in cause of logic is someone who says, yes, I know where the world is headed. I don't have the resources right now. Let me work towards acquiring that resources. Interestingly, most entrepreneurs, even though earlier research suggested that they sat in the visionary quadrant, but subsequently and fairly long-term research has suggested that entrepreneurs actually sit in this quadrant where their control levels are high and their prediction levels are low. In other words, they do not think of the future as much as we think they do. What they do is they say, let me see what I have. Let me see what I control. And using that, let me see what I can create. And I am confident that what I create will play a part in the world of tomorrow, in, in the life of tomorrow. In other words, they're saying that it is not possible to predict because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So let us create that tomorrow. So in some sense, what they're saying is they're not creating 
against a set goal, but they are creating from a set origin point, which is what they can control today. So that's essentially effectual logic as, as was introduced by Professor Saraswati from the University of Darden. And that's the frame that I'm going to use now to talk about linking entrepreneurship with uh, educators. So when you look at causal versus effectual reasoning, causal logic is typically what you would expect a manager in, a, in a, an established firm to do, which is that they select between given means to achieve a predetermined goal. In other words, they have a target, they have a goal, they have something which is usually defined in numeric terms and said, you have to achieve that and they work backwards, right? Work backwards and saying, okay, then what do I need to achieve that given goal? So that's, that's classical causal logic. On the other hand, what an entrepreneur does is say that this is what I have, right? I have a set of means they may not even be coherent at first glance, but given these means, what can I create? Right? So this is a very, very fundamental distinction between the two kinds of logics. And this effectual logic is increasingly where we see entrepreneurs kind of defining themselves. Now, you may argue saying, when I start an entrepreneurial venture, do I not have a goal in mind? Do I not have a vision in my head saying, this is what I want to create, this is what I want to change in the world? The answer, given the trajectory of entrepreneurs across the world, is ambivalent on that. It's both a yes and a no. Usually what entrepreneurs start off is they have a sense of what they want to bring into the world. And then they gradually even shape what they want to bring into the world by using the means and resources they have at their disposal. In other words, no entrepreneur wakes up and says, seven years later, I see myself running X business in this business model churning out Y million dollars or rupees of revenue and so on and so forth. While for the sake of business plans, they need to put that in. The true entrepreneur actually does not necessarily think that way. So they start with an idea and then they kind of develop it and it kind of shapes up. And many of us keep hearing the word pivot all the time in the business world. The pivot is essentially that I've come across a new resource, I've come across a new mean, and therefore I'm changing what my end solution is. And most of entrepreneurs end up pivoting more than once in their entrepreneurial journey, especially in the initial days. Uh, having said that, one is not saying that causal logic does not work. Causal logic works when you have an established market, an established product, an established organization, and therefore a structured way of doing things. Effectual logic is when you're trying to break into something new, create something absolutely uh, un non-existent at this point in time. And, and the reason I'm tying this back to an academic frame is something that I will come to now. But before that, let me quickly spend a couple of minutes explaining what effectual logic is. And I was mentioning Sarah. Sarah is a person I've kind of worked with in the past as well. So she defined effectuation as the process through which you work with things that are within your control and you don't have to predict the future, right? So it says you work with what is in your control and you co-create. I think two or three words that are key here. One is what is in your control, right? Which means what resources do you have? What characteristics you have even as, as an entrepreneurial individual and what networks you have, who you know, what you know, et cetera, and co-creation. Typically entrepreneurs from the 30s have initially been kind of projected as individuals, trying to change the world by being mavericks, by being avant-garde, going against the system and fighting their battles pretty much like Don Quixote. But successfully, you, I mean, success, succeedingly, you notice that entrepreneurs are no longer individuals fighting standalone battles. One of the biggest things they do is co-create. Co-creation happens with customers, co-creation happens with supply chain partners, co-creation happens with ecosystem partners, it happens with their network, their friends and family in many cases, et cetera. So co-creation is a very important aspect of entrepreneurship and you will be able to realize that it's, it's an equally important aspect of teaching as well. Traditionally, we've also looked at teachers as individual purveyors and owners of knowledge and therefore they will teach you on their own. But today you notice that teachers access a wide range of resources, a wide range of networks to teach and to kind of take the students into the future as it were. So that's that's really the foundation of, of effectuation. And further down, what happened was effectuation was also kind of operationalized. That's, that's typically what you would expect from classic social sciences research, which is you have a principle and then you operationalize it. So five principles of uh, 
co-creation is is what uh, Saras and team kind of established, and this is what is now defined as the foundations of effectuation. So there are five fundamental principles, and I'll kind of go into each of them in detail. Uh, first one is going from the bottom left is is bird in hand, which is what do you have and how can you use that. The second, interestingly, is affordable loss. I, I kind of touched on that briefly. We say, uh, do entrepreneurs take risk? But actually, you notice that entrepreneurs take risks that are affordable. Right? So in other words, they are conservative relatively when it comes to risk taking. Third principle is called the crazy quilt principle. And I'll come to that in detail a little bit. It basically means how do you assemble different scraps and put a quilt together, which is of some coherence. The fourth is lemonade. And as the old expression goes, if life gives lemons, make lemonade. So entrepreneurs are very quick to kind of understand the essence of that principle. And the last one is pilot in the plane. Notwithstanding so many other things, they realize or they acknowledge that they are in control. So therefore, what does that mean when you say you are in control, which means you do things that you can do with the best of your ability and not leave things to chance. So again, in some sense, it goes back to bird in hand, it goes back to affordable loss. Right? So these are some, the fun, these are the fundamental principles of effectuation. Now let's see how kind of they tie with the world of academia. So the first principle of bird in hand basically says what? It says, who am I? Who am I as an entrepreneur? What are my motivations? What are my interests? And this is a very, very interesting point, which is entrepreneurs do not start their entrepreneurial journey by looking outside. They usually start their entrepreneurial journey by looking at themselves. What excites me? What motivates me? What problems do I face? A simple for example, an entrepreneur in uh, Hyderabad I worked with, she started a business making furniture for children. And her motivation for that is not because she understood furniture science. She was a software engineer by education. But she had twins. And when they had twins, she and her husband went looking for safe furniture at home. And the only furniture they could find was flimsy plastic furniture. And therefore, they said, we want stable wooden furniture for our homes. And we're not able to find them. Let's try and make them ourselves. So that was the spur for her to start that business. And today she runs that business very successfully in, in Hyderabad. And her husband has also quit his job and joined her business because it's grown big enough and needed multiple people to kind of run it. So, so it came from a very personal source. And you talk to most entrepreneurs, it comes from something within. Sometimes it could be their education and what they've learned and what they know. In some cases, it's about what bothers them. So a lot of social entrepreneurs get into their businesses because it bothers, something bothers them. I need to address the problem of pollution. I need to address the problem of solid waste management, et cetera. So it comes very much from what motivates them. It comes from what they know. And most importantly, it also comes from who do they know? Because as, as we will acknowledge readily, a lot of our thinking is also shaped by the people that we interface with, the people we respect and learn from, and the people we regard, the people we are in constant touch with, right? So whether consciously or unconsciously, we kind of pick things up from our networks. And therefore, entrepreneurs pick up a lot of their ideas and a lot of their impetus, if you will, even from the people they know. So network effects is something that's been studied across multiple domains in the world of entrepreneurship it leads to even entrepreneurship. And that's something that you will notice that, you know, people who are in entrepreneurial networks tend to become more and more entrepreneurial. It's a virtuous cycle in some sense. But the other thing that entrepreneurs also are great at stretching is to extend their networks, right? So who do I know and who do they know? So through my networks, can I talk to other people, etc.? This has nothing to do with extroversion because there was, at one point of time, there was a school of thought which said that entrepreneurs are typically extroverts because they, they need to go out and talk to people and, Extroversion is the foundation, foundational to building networks, etc. It's not necessarily so. There are as many entrepreneurs that are introverts because they focus and work on with smaller networks, but even they tend to reach out to people within their network and build their strengths. But so these are some of the core principles that the bird in hand aspect of effectuation uh, kind of explored and discovered. And then when you reflect on this and say, as a teacher, how do I apply these principles. I've got a few thoughts here for you and feel free to kind of expand on it. So again, as a teacher, you know, yes, I teach a certain subject because I know that subject very well. And that's foundational. So you don't want to be teaching a subject that you've not learned or you don't know. But beyond that, think about ourselves. What are my passions and interests? And can I use them in my teaching? Uh, there used to be a professor in uh, Bits Pilani long, long back who used to teach mathematics. And he used to teach maths, he used to teach uh, exponential series and so on. 
he used the concept of rangoli to teach his students and i'd heard this first hand from a student of his who happens to be my brother as well so he used to use concepts of rangoli to teach fundamental principles in maths he used to literally used to draw a rangoli on this on the blackboard in those days and draw the dots and connect the dots and show how it becomes an exponential function and so on and so forth so it comes from a very fundamental passion and interest in knowledge that he has some of us have other concept for instance a professor in operations management uh, in isb when i used to work there he was teaching a bunch of uh, early stage women entrepreneurs on operations management and he had to teach them the concept of bottlenecks no bottlenecks is is and is not a simple topic so you know if you are a b school student or if you've been working in industry long enough it's easy to explain the concept of bottlenecks and why they are problems in business so but this faculty could not figure out how to use that in business and he apparently had a conversation and he told me this so this is second hand information he said he was talking to his wife about this and said so fast trading how do i teach them bottlenecks and his wife apparently suggested why don't you look around the house and see how me and my your mom operate in the kitchen and he observed them and he went back to class next day and he taught bottlenecks using a very simple analogy if two women are in a kitchen and they're cooking rotis and they have only one tawa what is the bottleneck so he kind of used simple examples like this expanded that theme and then tried to establish the fact that therefore what a bottleneck means so these come from simple interest simple passions that you may have apart from your knowledge if you insist on teaching operations management using formulae you can do that but that will apply to a certain set of audiences but to a different set of learners you may want to use something from your interest your passion now the interesting point here is there are two assumptions here one is uh, like an entrepreneur i i keep asserting that even academics are idiosyncratic even academics are individuals right so it's not like you have a standard format you have a standard set of slides and you just read it exactly the way some other professor would teach each of us approach it in our own individual manner and therefore it's perfectly all right for us to use those tricks and techniques if you will in your teaching the second thing is typically we hear a lot about student centered learning uh, some of these suggestions may sound like teacher centered learning they actually are not because the, the point that's being made here is you use an approach that you can do best because if you can do your best then it stands to reason that it will benefit your students the best so in in a sense it's actually a teach student centered teaching approach but it's also a way of how do i bring the best in myself so that's really the essence of of these suggestions the other point is and i kept i said this in the beginning when it comes to the use of technology a lot of us use technology in our day to day lives but when it comes to teaching or when it comes to our profession we kind of look at technology from a professional lens but if i can use technology at in my personal life how can i use that same technology in my workplace is a question that's worth thinking and that's again entrepreneurs come from there right so if this is what interests me if this is what i'm good at in my personal life how do i kind of translate that into my uh, into my professional life uh, the other aspect is, is on networks and i know that increasingly academics have begun to do that very effectively in terms of tapping into their networks you know they they could be faculty that they went to school with that they did research with the faculty in other institution it could also be friends or social people from their social networks who they think can bring value to their students given what they need to teach and interestingly and this is something that some faculty have begun exploring very deeply and i think it's probably going to only increase as we move along is to look at your own alumni network you keep teaching students every year can they come back to school tomorrow once they are into their careers and can they be part of your educational network can they come in i mean it, it's easy to say i'll pick the success stories from there and bring them as guest speakers but each one of them and you know your alumni because you've kind of seen them for two years and if you're in touch with some of them you can see what strength they, they can bring to the table either in terms of technology adoption or in terms of even being part of the teaching process as far as you're concerned so that's another area that you can look at very closely and thanks to technology even if you don't adopt it very actively you have enough technology through which you can keep in touch with your alumni and i'll talk about a couple of examples uh, later today as well but that that's another rich source of learning for for a lot of us the second principle is affordable loss so this is typical risk aversion so entrepreneurs typically tend to count, control the downside on it until they get funding and they're allowed to spend more than they they expect to earn which which is not the definition of a true entrepreneur 
but they only invest what they can afford to lose and this is not just in terms of money it's also in terms of time it's also in terms of reputation and emotion yes it's good to fail it's you learn from failure but they know that more than a few failures even they themselves will not be able to handle emotionally so they only go so far in terms of loss aversion they fail cheap right so they fail early in the process and then they kind of pivot they reinvent they redo the way they think and once they find a success point then they escalate that success so it's it's a it's climbing walking falling like a child would do in the learning process of walking but that's exactly how entrepreneurs seem to approach their business control your risks till you find success and then use that success to kind of climb up right very straightforward to apply from a teaching perspective and this is something that uh, i keep having conversations with a lot of my fellow colleagues as well here among our faculty group it's the moment i say technology in learning people come back and say okay synchronous learning is synchronous learning learning management systems for say a six week course etc but technology is not necessarily only those big bucket experiments how do we think small how do we use small pieces of technology in our learning process how do we experiment with technology because experimentation is when we also learn how to use it better so thinking small is something that as far as technology adoption is concerned is something that i would seriously recommend it's something that i have personally benefited from by exploring little little things seven or 10 minutes of chat gpt here teaches you a lot nowadays but those are thinking small it's not like suddenly saying how do i use chat gpt in my course that can happen much later how do i use chat gpt to structure my thinking is something that you can start with small how can i use small tools that i otherwise use in my normal life whatsapp is the most overused and underused tool as far as learning is concerned for example and the other thing is don't fall in love with any one technology or tool and this is uh, it, it's obvious and it's easy for us to say of course but quite often we end up doing that inertia is a very very powerful thing in our thinking in our action in in anything that we do so this is something that is, is very easy for us to kind of appreciate very difficult to to follow but it's kind of found foundational to effectuation and therefore entrepreneurial thinking the third thing and i kind of these are all overlapping concepts as you would recognize is the principle of crazy quilt and what's foundational to it is you build multiple partnerships entrepreneurs are not never saying that i'll build one partnership work with only one vendor or one person right so they build multiple partnerships and they build partnerships at a 360 degree level it's not just their vendors or supply partners it's also their customers and the important thing for entrepreneurs when they forge partnerships is that they forget competitors as a term it's not like competition does not exist but they look at competitors as people who can probably enhance their own offering so there are enough entrepreneurs who work very closely with competitors sometimes to strengthen their products to work together so we compete in one market but we kind of supplement each other in another market and even in big business it's very common that out externally they may look like competitors but they have a lot in common and they have a lot of knowledge sharing happening between them as well and therefore they co-op everybody into their uh, circuit and that's something that educators like i mentioned earlier we've been doing quite a lot on and gone are the days when we used when we used to say that we are sages on the stage we more guides by the side and therefore as guides we bring in other guides who can kind of help shape the educational process and here i'll be a little prescriptive and say that whenever we design a course especially if it's a purely classroom based course think of it as a hybrid course in other words think if you can bring in someone from outside even if it's in a virtual format or in a technology format into our course because then it widens possibilities tremendously because if i think that i want to do a course and i can call people to come and teach i am geographically bound by the fact that i don't want to get someone coming from delhi to bangalore all the way to do one course but if there's someone in delhi who can do an outstanding session for me can i get them in on a hybrid mode i know of institutions which kind of say that once a course is designed don't bring virtual folks in but bring only classroom folks in but that's a, that's a battle in my opinion worth fighting because it it expands your pool it expands the number of pieces in that quilt that you can finally assemble as as an academic and exploring multiple tools and i don't mean having five lmss in an institution but smaller tools and technology is increasingly characterized by small tools not big frameworks which is why the word word lms is increasingly used less and less now but apps tools are used more common so you can use multiple of them and i already talked about this looking at your classmates looking at your alumni as co teachers as resource people as technology enablers but also think i mean we keep saying whenever we think of getting faculty into our classrooms we keep saying other faculty we keep saying people in industry who can come and share stories but are there other networks that we can explore people who are 
on the face of it unconnected to what we teach or unconnected to where our alumni are but who can bring in skills who can bring in elements that can kind of spike up the interest and discussion in the class and uh, i mean sadak so talked about saying we brought people from policy into the room as far as these talks are concerned but people from government people from policy can be very valuable people to come in and talk in the classroom or if you're doing a social science course to bring in someone from the pure sciences can kind of expand the way people think especially in areas like research methods and so on to kind of really kind of change the way your students may may think about what you teach them the lemonade principle yeah this is a favorite principle of mine and i remember giving a tedx talk probably 12 years ago on almost exactly the same topic where i talked about what i called the technology affected learner and the foundational principle of that was essentially the lemonade principle which is to say that don't look at things for the positives or the negatives especially when it comes to technology it is what it is so i'll jump into our educator perspective technology is neither a positive nor a negative how we use it makes all the difference so quite often we keep saying oh technology is coming to threaten me technology is going to take away my job it's going to make it difficult for my learner it's going to make it boring i don't know whether my learners are listening it's very easy to list as many positives about technology as we can list negatives but the fact of the matter is technology is positive or negative only based on how we use it it is a passive tool that is just there right so that's that's essentially the lemonade principle which is that if it is there try to make the best of it use the positive out of that if there is something unexpected focus on how to make it profitable it's what an entrepreneur will do focus on the can rather than the ought it's easy for us to say no ought but the world is not driven by our oughts the world is driven by what it can and how well we kind of mold our teaching how well we mold our strategies towards it and important recognition is the recognition of equifinality we've had this debate and i remember even uh, maman and i have had this long back which is can some subjects be taught online but not in the class and some subjects be taught in class and not online so this either or has been a pervasive kind of theme in conversations around technology but very rarely have we discussed the concept saying that a certain subject can be taught equally well in the classroom as it can in the online format and the honest truth is that's probably true right we do assume that technology is better for something but classroom is better for something else but there are many instances where both are equally good for the same solution so think of solutions which use tech think of solutions which are no tech and maybe it's even a research question to explore for some of you who are inclined like that right and the other question is about students and we keep um, coursera keeps giving me chapter and verse about decreasing attention spans increasing preference for video over the written word and and so many other changes which for purists like us we may want to squirm for people who would rather read a printed book than view a movie but the fact remains that we are teaching students who are what they are today right so it's it's probably worth trying to see what we can learn from them in terms of how they are what they are rather than saying how do we want them to be yes we want to shape them but we want to shape them given what they are so i think it's important to also understand what they are and figure out whether what they are is necessarily not negative right so again equifinality is possible as as some people keep arguing i can learn as much watching a movie as i can while reading a book for many of us intuitively that sounds incorrect or sounds blasphemous even but there is a possibility that you can get equifinality between two different approaches and the last part is the pilot in the plane principle which says control your variables work on what is important for you work with your schedule and this is something that i talked about women entrepreneurs and independence they want to define their entrepreneurial venture because then they can do what they want to do it gives them a certain independence but more importantly they also say that i can stick to who i am so if i am a designer let me do design stuff why do i sit and do programming right so so that's essentially the principles of the pilot in the plane and again the same thing for entrepreneurs don't ask what can technology do for me ask what i want from the technology or what i can get out of it and use the tools that suit you hey, this is something that babson came up as a very very fundamental proposition for entrepreneurs do something that suits you and they say research has proven time and time again it's like people who take up performance sport right you cannot take up a sport and be successful if you do not enjoy that sport or if you are not good at that sport and both are equally important it is difficult to be good at something but not enjoy it it can happen over time which is when they retire or move out but even for entrepreneurs the same thing you cannot run an entrepreneurial venture with a product or a service that a you are not good at or b you are not convinced about or c you are not interested in or passionate about 
The same applies to us in terms of using technology. If you say that I hate Zoom, you were never going to be good at Zoom. It's it's really sounds simplistic when I put it that way, but that's really the essence of it. We will need to like what we use. We will need to use what we are comfortable with and what works for us in terms of our personality, our style, our preferences, etc. So that's essentially the the pilot principle. So uh, if we have a quick few minutes, I'd like to run over a few basic examples that I kind of pulled out from both my experience and from the research literature published across India and the rest of the world, largely from India, of how different educational initiatives have kind of used technology in a very small way, but create deep impact. And I've deliberately used small examples because one can talk about using Coursera, one can talk about using learning management systems, one can talk about using Zoom for classrooms, et cetera. They are classical institutional ways of using technology, but I'm looking at how individual faculty can use technology, individual educators can use technology. And many of my examples are from the world of schools. And the reason for that is innovation in schools has A, a deeper impact, but B, it's tougher to make an impact because you're dealing with children and getting them to use technology is in some senses a double-edged sword, but pardon me while I run you through these examples. The first is this small, but very ubiquitous thing called the QR code, right? It's almost laughable to call it a technology because it's so in your face everywhere. You get into an auto, you see it. You go to a pawn shop, you see it. You go to a big store, you see it. Everyone uses the QR code. And increasingly, one is seeing the use of that in the academic space as well. Extrap Foundation, which is co-founded by Nandan Nilekani, who also happens to have been a co-founder of my institution, they started off with this and they now run it across multiple states. They have QR codes in textbooks, which enables children and teachers to access support material because teachers in remote corners may not always know what material to access or you don't want them kind of Googling all the time. So they synthesize extend additional content and put that through a QR code. The students can just use their parents' mobile phones, scan the QR code and look for additional material and learn for themselves. So it becomes like a tutorial for them. Uh, an individual called Ranjit Singh Disale in Solapur in Maharashtra has done a similar thing. And he's done it for children of underprivileged children of grades one to four, right? So he's put it into their school textbook so that when they go home, they can access those QR codes to access audio, video, even created simple worksheets that they can work from home on because these are children from really underprivileged uh, families. And for them to do a worksheet using this instead of you know pr taking prints and physically doing it is actually even cost effective. So these are simple things that we have been doing. And I know a lot of you are probably adopting this, but some of these small tools tend to remain unsung in the context of, uh, of education. The second, and I mentioned this briefly earlier, is uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp's been used in so many different contexts. I've given you two contexts which are not your traditional ones of keeping in touch with parents or forming groups with students to provide them with announcements. But two areas where it worked really strongly, one that I was very closely involved with, which is around community mobilization and activist education. Uh, some of my colleagues work very closely with uh, activists around housing and human rights for underprivileged people living in the busties of Delhi. And uh, they started using WhatsApp as a group medium of communication, put all those people in groups. Now, that sounds like a very fundamental thing. All of us are probably part of at least 10 groups, which wake us up with very pleasant messages every morning. But uh, these groups were absolutely mind-blowing in terms of their impact. Because you're talking of underprivileged people, uneducated people, you're talking about women who don't have access to other forms of information. Now, this kind of broke all those social barriers for two reasons. One, thanks to the financial, I mean, the digitalization of finance in the country, all people today in these busties had smartphones. And if you can afford to download a PTM or a Google Pay on your phone, then downloading uh, WhatsApp does not require any more effort or expense. So therefore, access increased many fold. Otherwise, traditionally, we were communicating to these communities and to these activists through email. And email is a very exclusive kind of uh, medium because not everyone has email. Not everyone knows how to access it. And therefore, it and it's a very formal piece of communication. So people can't write emails very easily. But on WhatsApp, one, or they made language typing very easy so people could use the Devnagri script very easily. More significantly, audio messages changed the equation because now people don't need to type and worry about whether their language is correct, but they just talk, record, and send out. So it's been absolutely kind of uh, transformational in the way we were able to kind of get the activists together, 
pushing learning to the activists so that they know what are the right bylaws they need to use when they talk to the corporators and they protest etc so they became more meaningful activists rather than just raising their voice in a righteous manner the first example is of a community of practice for teachers this i'm sure some of you would have also done but it's not just to circulate information but teachers within multiple villages around mysore were able to kind of share best practices use lesson plans from one another and use exercises from each other to work collaboratively and effectively the third is not so much technology but the concept of time right so quite often we are governed by time and we say we have this period in the morning this period in the afternoon etc but two examples one is you must have all of us must have heard of heard of the barefoot college in rajasthan and they work and now they work across 11 states but actually they've gone, probably gone more than that so they work with children who work with their parents in their farms or in their family work so not quite child labor but they have to support the family in their work and therefore they do not have the time to attend class during the day so barefoot college started a whole series of night schools where children used to come for 3 hours after class to come and study they used a variety of technology tools during that time including solar panels etc so there was education on solar as well so that was one uh, very significant uh, initiative from the barefoot college the also other close out of my heart is the ishwa foundation in hyderabad the declaration my wife and my sister have been very closely associated with them but during the covid period they worked very extensively using whatsapp in the evenings and they had to do this because the children did not have access to phones and their parents were going off for their daily work so they waited till the children came back after 7 o'clock in the evening they did whatsapp based classes and the level of participation the children could not turn their video on because a their bandwidth was not great and b the, the lighting in where they were was not uh, adequate but that made them more courageous to come out and speak and express themselves ask questions etc very heartwarming when you look at the ground level results of this and of course it was opportunistic because covid 19 forced them because nobody could come to school but the fact remained that they used very fundamental technology reset the clock as it were in terms of timing and achieved transformational results and in terms of videos uh, i know we're running short on time but quickly in terms of videos we had teacher made videos and i think this is something that i would urge all of us to consider we provide a lot of videos that are provided that are created by third party and yes they are authentic they are accurate but teacher created videos tend to be more authentic more in an accent and a language that our learners understand and they serve very credible alternatives to ourselves so we can give them video lectures that we have created on topics and then continue in the classroom with the follow up activity and that is what uh, mariam batsamosa also did which was very interesting where she said we'll record teachers when they are teaching this is something that's very common in performing uh, arts and in high performance sports where you record their performance to see how they can get better so similarly if we can record the way we teach in our classrooms i know all our zoom calls are recorded today but how often do we use that to increase or enhance our own teaching skills is something that's worth thinking about it also enables us to share best practices from different teachers across the community but i think using videos for our own development quite often we think of using technology for my learner but how do i use technology for myself how do i use technology to improve myself as a teacher i think what mariam has been doing in surat is an exceptional opportunity for us to kind of explore and finally the flipped classroom right so quite often we've been working with the flipped classroom for a very very long time now and the basic definition of a flipped classroom is to say that now i won't lecture in the class i will give the lecture as a video and i will come into the class and discuss but here is a different variation of the flipped classroom that preman and malayakal tried out in kochi in kolikod where he taught the students english but he asked them to submit their assignments in multiple formats he didn't insist that they only write essays and this is going back to understanding what students prefer to do as i spoke about earlier so they could submit it in the form of an infographic they could submit it in the form of a blog post or any other form of you know web material etc therefore they learn a new skill as well how to create infographics how to create blog posts in addition to understanding their content and you put it putting it in an intersection of where they are interested and where you want them to learn so this is an interesting example and i'm wondering if this is a take off point for us to kind of flip the teacher student relationship today we say we will teach them and then ask them to do assignments can we flip it and as richard feynman said every time i want to learn something new i always promise to teach it because that will make me learn it so can we split our class into groups and ask each group to teach one module of a six module course and we sit back and listen and figure out how they have learned so this is typically what we would do in our phd kind of classes where we have the format where students kind of do the session so is that something that we can extend get them more interested in learning etc so i will stop there and 
I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, sir. We have about 15 minutes, uh, a little more than 15 minutes for question and answers. So Great, okay. Whoever has a question can just um, unmute and ask, if that's okay. You could also type your questions in the chat box. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thanks for the session. I'm Saurabh, and I'm a student of MA at uh, Educational Technology. So I had uh, one very basic question of, uh, I mean, if it fits into the premise, I'm not very sure whether it would fit into the premise, but as an entrepreneur and an, ex and an educator, uh, how or uh, is there any limitation uh, of how my business is going to uh, control the the kind of education I provide. Uh, I, I hope my uh, you know I'm able to articulate my uh, doubt well. Uh, so does the business really influence the kind of education we offer and how deeply can this business uh, control H how can it even control it or if it is already controlling, uh, is it a good thing or is it not very welcome in the present space? So what what business are you referring to, uh, Sarah? No, the business side of the education. So where there are so many institutions, there are there's the government as a player, there's the private, uh, uh, you know, organizations as players. But there is the business side of it that controls the whole the whole school education and higher education that we see in India. So the way it is taught is usually um, driven by the business uh, outcomes that the players see. So, how do you think that is uh, going on in India, and do you see that? Uh, do you see any changes that are welcome here? So, that is something that I think is tightly intertwined because ultimately, if you look at education, education has a purpose for someone who's learning, right? And if that purpose is to go into government service, then therefore, how the government evolves has a role to play in what we teach them. Similarly, if, if your students are going to go and work in the corporate sector and how changes in the corporate sector will affect your your teaching is, is an automatic, right? So, because teaching, I mean, rather learning is, is, a, is a means to an end for a majority of students. Even for a researcher, learning is a means to an end, right? So I learn because I want to research, because I want to produce new knowledge. And how that new knowledge manifests itself has a bearing in how they are taught. So yes, they're going to be strongly intertwined. And again, like I argue with technology, I would suggest here again, we not don't look at that as a positive or a negative. It is a reality that we will need to work with, which is the reason we want to bring people from industry into our classrooms to talk about what they expect and what's going on there and what students should be ready with. Sure, sir. Um, thank you. So my question was more on how the teaching is affected by the business goals. Uh, how education as such is being influenced by the business players in the industry. Uh, how these people by are the able to control part? the teaching by the business players in the industry. So there are institutions mm -hmm. which are uh, actually influencing. So I, I, uh, I'll give you an example of how I'm seeing this happen. So I see a lot of uh, engineering colleges pop up in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, during the mm -hmm. 90s and 2000s, a lot of engineering colleges popped up because people were opting for that course. But that was not a you know mm -hmm. welcome change. Uh, it just produced mass-produced engineers, uh, but they did not really have that engineering acumen, neither the acumen nor the knowledge. So they were just engineers. Mm -hmm. And that is not a very you know positive change that I could see. Uh, so that was a business-driven uh, goal on the on the teaching, on the education. Uh, uh, sector. Uh, so how, as an example, this was just an example, and I'm pretty sure uh, there are so many such things that happen uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that are driven by the business goals and that are imposed on education, right? So uh, in the present scenario, in given the given the present scenario, the availability of technology, the accessibility of technology to to you know, is, which is much more than what it was earlier, and uh, there's so many other factors that we are uh, right now seeing. 
how do you see the business goals affecting the accessibility the use and the 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 very incorporation of those tools in education yeah you're seeing that happening already isn't it so, i mean a lot of technology in the education space can be argued have come in from a commercial business kind of perspective and uh, honestly i mean i will not see that as as uh, i mean i i don't see that kind of coming down because fundamentally they are all feeding off each other right business is also looking at opportunity education is also looking to get better and so on yes there is bad quality that comes out in the process but that is an indication of any developing sector right i mean anybody anywhere there is growth there will be it's like the equivalent of the texan gold rush so you will see a gold rush from industry coming in and there will be bad quality but you will notice that like you mentioned a lot of institutions came out but not many have actually stood the test of time right so so that's that's a call that you'll also have to put a temporal lens when you view some of these aspects and also i mean those are also systemic or policy level questions i mean i, I mean i can argue that but as an individual academic individual entrepreneur i wouldn't at this point kind of worry about that uh, there's a question by anusha can you read it uh, uh, thank you that, yeah I, I can see it here i can yeah. take that moment yeah so tech based entrepreneurship models seem to require high human time and resource investment in creating and enabling structures this has created a high flow yes interesting question anisha and uh, the answer is as you would expect both so we do have students who were not able to kind of raise these resources and therefore have been unavail uh, unable to scale up but uh, one of the things that happened and i think this is a very powerful example of the network effect is when we did uh, one of the one of the cohorts of of the women entrepreneurship program that we did was in i am bangalore and we had uh, two or three uh, women entrepreneurs uh, who were in uh, high tech businesses not in the education business but in the high tech uh, entrepreneurship and high tech entrepreneurship ventures and they had very similar kind of challenges in terms of uh, infrastructure and the interesting thing and i spoke about this in in one of my points earlier is that they didn't look at each other as competition they didn't look, look at each other as saying that we are here for the same share of the pie so they end up collaborating and setting up a common uh, frame for accessing resources so they kind of did a shared resources model between themselves and that they were able to kind of address that but having said that yes uh, when you say tech based entrepreneurship models uh, i mean i'll need to With kind of interpret to education that so for instance if someone yes. is doing a tech based uh -huh. intervention model with an intervention gadget or uh, there is a no there is a lot of training mm -hmm. that is involved there's a lot of maintenance that is involved it before it takes off and that requires yeah. a lot of uh, you know human presence on the field intensely mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if you don't have big investments at the beginning and you have not able to raise these resources then you invariably are not able to go beyond one school or three schools that you're able to personally service and the others you are not able to find mm. your people because you may not have enough money to pay and so on and so forth so um, how could they think of there are many yeah. <laughs> actually who do have mm. great ideas but are absolutely yeah. not able to do it and even they tried crowdfunding but not really worked through crowdfunding mm. both it was interesting models they tried crowdfunding of both money uh, to pay and also crowdfunding in terms of networking as you said through reaching out but then mm -hmm. geographies become problematic so just wanted to understand mm -hmm. if you had any models for that yeah yeah so there have been instances i mean i know of an entrepreneur in tamil nadu she started a venture from i think coimbatore which was in the edtech space so she was literally kind of working with colleges so that's then the classical approach is one of the things that entrepreneurs also are careful about and also and many of them fall into that trap is to kind of think too big too fast i mean like you said if i have uh, the capability to address two schools how do i plan for doing five schools next so that's really not an entrepreneurship question but more like a business causal logic question but that's an area where then they start structuring so you stop thinking like an entrepreneur start thinking like a businessman so it's a, it's a whole new question already but yes there have been people who have been able to scale up gradually without having to kind of rely on high resources coming from some kind of a single source as it were so. anybody else who'd like to um ask a question
Okay, so as there are no more questions um, here, we can move towards our close group interaction with the MA in Education and Technology students. Uh, before we break out and do a breakout room for the closed group discussion, um, I'd like to say thank you so much for the very interesting talk that has left all of us thinking um, about topics that we've probably not considered or paid too much attention to. So thank you so much, sir, for taking the time from your day to come and speak with us. Um, you'll get a prompt on your screen for the breakout room. Uh, please join it. And uh, sure. anyone who's interested in knowing more about the MA in Education and Technology program that is offered by CET, you can stay back here. Um, some of us will stay back to speak with you.